Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Yes, we're still on the same book. There are a lot of two-minute stories that aren't two minutes. And I'm going to try at least a few more before we change it up. So we are reading three stories from My Bedtime Book of Two-Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. We try it a little different this time. Credits up front. Waiting for the Dentist, written by Rosemary Garland. May Tree Blossom, written by Margaret Connor. And Beaver Lodge, written by Rosemary Bromley. Starting with Waiting for the Dentist, which is also oh fun. Yeah, with a title like that, I'm a bit worried. Christopher was waiting for the dentist. He had been there before, and he knew that the dentist had a big chair that went up and up when the dentist pumped it with his foot. That was fun. Then the dentist asked him to open his mouth while he poked around inside to see if Christopher's teeth were nice and strong. Christopher didn't mind very much, but he wished the dentist didn't make him keep his mouth open so long and so very wide. Christopher and his mother waited in the big room all by themselves at first. Suddenly, Christopher saw a big tank full of fish. Look, Mother, that wasn't here last time, he said, and he ran over and watched the fish lazily drifting amongst the little weeds. One opened and shut his mouth all the time. He looks as if he's at the dentist, laughed Christopher. But he hasn't any teeth, has he? No, said Mother, and they watched the fish for a long time. Just then, another little boy came into the waiting room with his mother and he was crying. I don't like the dentist, he kept crying. But Christopher was still watching the fish. Suddenly he saw the sand heaving about at the bottom of the tank. Why, there's one trying to bury itself in the sand, he shouted with excitement. The other little boy ran across to see. Look at this silly fish, said Christopher. He's nearly disappeared under the sand. Christopher and James, the other little boy, had such fun together chattering about the fish that James forgot to cry anymore. Look, there's a black one, said James. He just popped out from behind that big shell. That's called a black mole, said his mother. Could I have a fish tank at home? asked Christopher. Yes, that would be fun. We'll save up and buy a new fish each week, said mother. Can I have a fish? asked James. Yes, said his mother. We will save up too. We might even win one at a fair. I did when I was a little girl. I took it home in a plastic bag full of water. Christopher and James talked and talked about which kind of fish they would buy first. They chattered so much that James didn't mind when the dentist's nurse came in and called him. He waved goodbye to Christopher and off he went. He didn't have to wait long, did he? asked Christopher. Well, I'm glad the time went so quickly, said Mother. It was watching the fish that made the time pass. It made you both forget all about the dentist. Okay, I wonder if these parents know how much they're getting into with fish. I know they seem like simple pets, but it can actually get kind of expensive. I'm not just talking about the really expensive fish. No, but the tank and food and chemicals and decor and making sure you get fish that are compatible with each other. And then it just skyrockets if you go saltwater. Mm-hmm, because I know this from experience. We're using lots of fish in my day. Even some crawdads and... You have a Plecostomus? Yeah, that's the one. That was the longest living fish I ever had. That thing, man, just... It kept going and going and going. <laughs> yeah, they like to suck all the gunk off the sides of the tank. So when the tank gets dirty, they're still reasonably happy. Yep. Now well, back to the art, which is... Hmm. It's very nice. Once again, the yellow coloring is used for inside the lines to give color to everything in different varieties of shading. The second boy in this picture here where Christopher is looking into the tank looks kind of awkward. It's almost like he has both his knees bent, but I think that's because of the way this knee is, this leg is straight and this when is bent, it almost gives us like the perspective of he's slightly to the side where you would think both his knees are bent. I'm just wondering, do people really keep snails in fish tanks? I don't ever remember doing that. There's a certain type of sea slug that does that, but no, I've never seen snails in a fish tank. Yes, and here there are several. And, well, now we have the scary dentist on the first page as well. He's not that scary. He looks like a very nice man. Shall we move on to the poem? Sure. 
The Little Bird. This is the tale of the little bird who was never seen and never heard. Then one fine day he sat upon the garden barrow and sang a song. Hmm, interesting. Yes, yeah, so he was never seen and s never heard, but we know he was on the garden barrow and that he sang a song. Also, if he's never seen and never heard, how do we know he was there? Yeah, I think that's the point of the poem. You have to question that one of those circular things. Hmm. You have a picture of a tree with what looks like it could be a nest. And then you have someone pushing a barrow full of flowers. Mm -hmm. And I don't actually see a bird in either of these. Yeah, nope. All right. Next story. May tree blossom. All the animals on May Tree Farm seem to be having babies. Mrs. Grunt the pig was the first with her ten piglets. Aren't they wonderful? She grunted through the gate of her sty as Mrs. Hen passed by. Mrs. Hen peeped through at the piglets who were rolling and squealing in the straw. Cluck, she cried. I like their curly tails. Mrs. Hen didn't have any babies, but she had been thinking she would like some for a long time. She sat on her nest most of the day and wouldn't come off it when Mrs. Farmer collected the eggs twice a day. She ruffles her feathers and tries to peck me, Mrs. Farmer told her husband. Well, we'd better let her hatch out some chicks, he said. There's an empty chicken house over in the long field. It just needs cleaning out a bit. So Mrs. Farmer and young Billy and little Sue cleaned out the chicken house and put fresh straw in the nest box. Then Mrs. Farmer took ten eggs from her basket and laid them carefully in the nest. When Mrs. Hen saw them, she clucked with delight. She hurried into the nest box and there she stayed, only coming out for food and exercise each day. Soon she had hatched out ten pretty baby chicks. Tell Mrs. Grunt I have ten babies now, she called to Dilly Duck, who was passing by with her ducklings on the way to the pond. Dilly Duck promised to tell Mrs. Grunt. She also told Nanny Goat as she passed through her field. Nanny Goat had just had twin kids and had only come back into her field that morning. We've been shut up in the goat shed for ages, she said. My kids were getting rather naughty shut up in there. They're better now that they can peep through the hedge and see the lambs. Quack, said Dilly. I didn't know Mrs. Baugh had any lambs. She peeped through the hedge. Why, she said, all the sheep have lambs. There are dozens of them skipping about all over the field. Quack, follow me carefully, she called to her ducklings as they waddled through a hole in the hedge behind her. I don't want you getting lost among all these lambs. Some of the lambs ran to hide behind their mothers as Dilly and her ducklings passed by. Quack, Dilly said to them, we won't hurt you. We're just on our way to the pond, that's all. Over by the pond stood Kitty, the brown mare. She was licking her newborn foal, who was lying on the grass. Farmer will be surprised, she told Dilly. Farmer was surprised when he came across the field and saw the foal. Already she was up and standing firmly on her four little legs. Come, Billy, come, Sue, he called as they came out of the cow shed. See what we have here. Oh, cried Sue. She is the nicest of all the new babies. What shall we call her? Let's call her Blossom, said Billy because she was born when the May blossoms out. Everybody on the farm loved Blossom. She was the favorite. Bella the cow had a fine young calf called Brownie, but Blossom was the pet of Farmer, Mrs. Farmer, Billy, and Sue. And now we're back to the full color art, and it is very lovely, very cute. It's got detail in all the right places. Also no outlines. And so... Mrs. Hen got 10 babies that weren't hers because she wasn't letting Mrs. Farmer take her eggs, but the eggs that Mrs. Farmer put in the nest box came from her basket, which means they came from other hens. Mm, probably some from her, too. Before she was starting to peck, or did she manage to get them from... I think she managed to get some from her. Yeah, it's a very nice art style, and you can see the goats and the sheep and the young sheep and the young goats and all the little piglets and the ducklings and blossom who apparently is a mary sue she's everybody's favorite i get it shall i move on to the poem mm -hmm. there was a young man who wore colored clothes and had a black mask and danced on his toes he loved a young lady 
whose dress was so fine. His name was Harlequin, and hers Columbine. Interesting. If it wasn't for the names, I was going to say, so Tuxedo Mask? <laughs> <laughs> uh, this predates Tuxedo Mask by a few decades, and so Harlequin, I believe, refers to the pattern, and Columbine is a flower. Very nice little arts, almost like figurines next to the poem. And then they each have a bit of a floral background. Harlequin seems to have some sort of branch with some type of berry on it. Looks a little bit like holly. And then columbine has branches with flowers on them that don't look like columbines. Hmm. All right, next story. Beaver Lodge. It was winter time, and Mrs. Beaver and her children were warm and snug in the living room of Beaver Lodge. Tell us how you built our house, said young Bertie Beaver. But I've told you that story many times, answered his mother. Well, I've never heard it, said the littlest beaver of the family. Very well, said Mrs. Beaver. One day, a long time ago, I met your father swimming in this stream. We decided to stay here and to build a house. We beavers nearly always build our houses in the middle of a pond, don't we? said Bertie. That's right, dear. It makes us feel safer to live surrounded by water, though some of our relations have their homes in riverbanks. Anyway, as there wasn't a pond here, we made one. How did you do that? asked the youngest beaver. We built a high wall, called a dam, across the stream to stop the water running away. And as it couldn't run away, it overflowed the banks of the stream and made a pond. What was the dam made of, mother? Trees and branches and stones and mud. We cut down young trees with those sharp teeth of ours and laid them across the stream. Then we stuck them together with mud. And you've seen for yourselves how high the dam is. And then you built Beaver Lodge. Yes, we made an island of sticks and mud and dug out this room in the center of it. To make quite sure that no one sees us coming or going, Daddy put the front and back doors below the level of the water. It's a good thing we're all such good swimmers, isn't it? Said one of the children. Go on with the story, Mom. Well, one day, Mrs. Beaver got no further. There was a loud rustling outside the room, and in burst Mr. Beaver. The dam is broken, he cried. There is no time to lose. We must all help repair it, or there will be no water left in our pond. The children chattered with excitement. Quiet, everyone, commanded Mr. Beaver. Now, if you all do exactly as you are told, we shall soon have it mended. There are some young trees on the edge of the river bank. Your mother and I will cut two of them down. Bertie, you will be ready to help push them through the water to the hole in the dam. The rest of you will carry as much mud as you can. We will all meet there. One by one, the family left Beaver Lodge, entered the water, and started to work. They used their webbed back feet and broad, flat tails to help them swim strongly. Mr. and Mrs. Beaver reached the bank and climbed out of the water. Quickly, each set about cutting down a tree. Soon, they had bitten through the bottom of the trunks, and the little trees splashed into the water. Bertie was waiting and swam off, pushing the trees in front of him. The other beaver children had scooped up as much mud as they could in their front paws, and were also swimming towards the dam. Very cleverly, Mr. Beaver laid the newly cut trees across the hole in the dam. Now, children, drop your mud over the branches. That will keep them in position. The youngest beaver was the last to bring his mud. You've done very well, dear, said his mother. Yes, our pond is safe now, said Mr. Beaver. Let's go back and have supper. As the moon rose over the pond, no one saw the beaver family swim up to their front door. Though Owl, sitting in the willow tree, thought he saw the water ripple. Okay, that was an interesting way to describe how beavers make their dams and homes. Mm-hmm. And the art style is back to the two-color tone where... We have yellow for our primary source of shading and color, and ink for the outlines. So those are very detailed beavers. Very much so in all three sets of images. There's an image above the beginning of the story, another image on the bottom corner of the same page, and then a larger image on the following page that, in case you can't tell by how quickly we got through the story, takes up almost half the page. And I think it illustrates the scene where they're um, repairing the dam, not actually building it. Right, because if it was when they were building the dam, there would only be two beavers. But we have a beaver up by the hole in the dam. We have another one pushing a branch. 
then we have two toppled trees on the banks and you have one beaver by the remaining trunk of the tree and another beaver pushing the second tree near the edge of the bank. So that actually implies more than two trees because the text says two trees and possibly the number of um, stumps indicates more trees were cut, though those could be from the original dam. Or previous work they've done. Hmm. So what did you think of these stories? <laughs> Definitely not ones that I remember so well. It's funny how it seems to be almost in sets. Because skimming ahead, I'm like, I kind of remember the next three. And if I skim a little further... Yeah, and I vaguely remember the one after that. So I guess there were just sections. And it doesn't seem to be based on author. Which ones I'm more interested in. So I'm not preferring a particular author's style. Because the story about Nobby, which I remember reading a lot, was written by Margaret Connor. And so was The Green Umbrella, which I didn't really read. So apparently it has nothing to do with author ability or the writing style of a particular author. I just like the ones that had certain topics. Mm -hmm. Horses. Yes, yes. Lots and lots of horses. There are books ahead that are not about horses that I remember quite well. And cats. Yes. The, uh, the ones that I thumbed ahead for do not have horses or cats. And no poem on this page, so no, we didn't skip something. Yep. And I think the artist did an, a very nice job on all three of these stories. Though I particularly like this last one. Well, it had more action. Because in Waiting for the Dentist, they were basically watching a fish tank. Which I admit to having done. Oh, I love watching fish. And I'm like, reading about someone watching fish. Yeah, it's kind of like reading about someone watching paint dry. It's riveting. And then the May Blossom story is basically, it's spring, everyone has children. That's basically all of it. So yes, there was a horse in it, but it was in the last, like, two paragraphs. Also, a horse called Kitty. Hmm. Kitty. No, horse. Kitty. <laughs> okay, we'll name her Kitty, just to make this easy. <laughs> Kitty. <laughs> so, this has been three entries from My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories. Edited by Rosemary Garland. Illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. So, yeah, Waiting for the Dentist. Written by Rosemary Garland. May Tree Blossom. Written by Margaret Connor. And Beaver Lodge. Written by Rosemary Bromley. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed this, you know, we've done a few. I think you might be enjoying it if you're still checking them out. Have you picked up a copy of the book yet? And then you could read along with us. Or you could read ahead, you know, get some spoilers maybe. See what stories we're reading next. Yeah, because we are going in order. No skipping until uh, we switch books, which may happen. Just feel like doing some ordinary shopping. I'm sure we have a plain Amazon link along with one to the book, if, my goodness, we're still managing to find it because... Bet somebody had to have bought one by now. And also just feel like doing some regular shopping. Clock's counting down for Christmas. At least as of the time of this original recording. And broadcast. Don't know about you people watching this in the future. Don't know what time it is then. Hi, future people. <laughs> uh, check out the regular Amazon and Ebates links. Amazon you know. Ebates offers you cash back for shopping at stores you probably already shop at anyways. Like Kohl's, Target, Toys R Us, Walmart. Most of them are there. Sign up and make a qualifying purchase of $25 and get a welcome bonus. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content of the Lux Analysis channel. We choose to share this stuff on our own. And we do get a little kickback if you go for it. But they're not our sponsors. They let anybody do this. Yep, anybody. Thanks again for listening.